easiest calculus books for beginners. I mean, this is probably the easiest one I have or one of the easiest ones. And it's great for beginners because you learn Calc 1, Calc 2, and Calc 3 all in one book. And you don't even need to know any trigonometry. I know that sounds ridiculous, but this book is written for a target audience that does not require trigonometry, right? That, that audience is not required to know trig. So you can learn calculus without trig. You might say, well, that's terrible. You should know trig. I think you should know trig. It's good to know trig. And calculus with trig is more fun. But if you want to just jump into the calculus and you know basic algebra, you can do that with this book. Now, there's other books like this that are also probably really good. This just happens to be the one that I used to teach a course in college with, right? So I used this uh, to teach for many years uh, a course to people who didn't know trig. They just knew algebra and they had to learn calculus. Now, I want to emphasize how much harder it is for people to learn calculus without trig. And it's not because they're lacking the trig that makes it harder. So when I've taught a class using this book, I have to go really, really slow. For example, I would spend a full day on like the product rule or the quotient rule or like a full day on the chain rule or like a full day where I do like 15 careful examples, you know? So I would do a lot of examples and do them slowly and explain everything really, really carefully because the students, they, all they had was algebra. So when you're a student and you take trig, yes, you learn trig, but you're, you just also get better at math. So it's like the act of taking the course makes you better at math. Also, most students who take a regular calculus course, not like a course that uses a book like this, would have trig and pre-calc, right? So their, their math would be very, very good. So this book is written for people who just know algebra. Okay, so I wanna emphasize that. And that's probably why it's so easy, right? Compared to the other calculus books, like the ones that STEM majors use, you know, the ones that engineers use. That doesn't mean to say that this is a watered down book. In fact, there are things in this book that I have used in class to teach my regular Calculus One students that I have found. So I've found examples in this book that I think are beautiful and I've shared them with my regular Calc 1 classes simply because I think this book is that great. So, and a lot of those examples, well, those, those specific examples were examples surrounding continuity and like, you know, just pictures of all the possible cases that you can think of and, uh, you know, where does continuity fail? You know, conceptual things, uh, good examples of differentiation and things like that. So let me show you the contents of this book so you can see what it contains. And I'm pretty sure there's newer editions. This book is not inexpensive. It's, you know, it's a textbook. So it's not like a workbook or anything like that. This is an actual textbook. 2010 Brooks Cole, I'm gonna give it a whiff. Ah, oh, it smells great. So I've done dozens of problems from this book, maybe hundreds, probably hundreds. Functions, starts with the basic stuff. Derivatives and their uses. So let's see what we have here, limits. So all this is Calc 1 stuff, chain rule, generalized power rule. I remember seeing that in this book, uh, I think for the first time, I was like, oh, okay, all right. That's what they call it, generalized power rule. Isn't it just, it's just the chain rule, but it's a special case, right? Non-differentiable functions. That's kind of like a fun optional section that I would always cover. This book has harder word problems when it comes to optimization, uh, and it has business applications and things like that. So. Um, that, that's going to be a challenge and that's actually harder than a lot of the stuff you, you would see in a regular Calc 1 class. So there is harder stuff in this book too. This is a very light section on exponential and log functions, but you see here it has some applications that you won't find in regular calculus books. And then here you have some more integration stuff. Now here, yeah, this is still some other applications here, still Calc 1 stuff. Here you're looking at Calc 2 stuff, usually integration by parts tables and proper integrals, that's definitely calc two. Some differential equations, wow, right? More differential equations. And then this is really cool, you've got some calc three stuff, right? So functions of several variables, partial derivatives, optimization, least squares, Lagrange multipliers, total differentials, and then multiple integrals. And then you get some answers to selected exercises in the back of the book. It's a wonderful book. Uh, I'll leave a link in the description. Um, it's just got really good examples. And also like the layout, look at the layout. I like the, I, I, I love this book, <laughs> so I really do. I really, really like this book. Um, I, I think I like it better than the other books that I've used to teach calculus with. And I mean, 
you know, like the Stewart book and the Larson book, those books, you know, I guess they have more content, but this is a much easier read for people. I think you can use this to, uh, to definitely do some self-study. But don't think it's, it's that easy, right? Like, again, I've taught this class for multiple years. I've taught it in the day. I've taught it at night. And, like, uh, people struggle, right? It's still hard. It's still hard because, uh, be because, you know, these people, all they've had is algebra. Whereas if you're in a Calc 1 class now and you pick up a book like this, you're going to feel like a rock star. Be like, oh, it's, it's going to make you feel smart. Let me, let me show you what I mean. So let's go to, here we go, product and quotient rule. So what do they have there in the exercises? A lot of examples, right? So look at all the exercises here and see how repetitious they are. Let me just zoom in here so you can see a bit better. But you see, you see how there's, there's just a lot of problems, right? And they're all kind of similar. There's, there's not a lot of variety. It's because you don't have trig functions and also the target audiences, they're just, they're just trying to barely change them. I mean, these problems are almost exactly the same, right? So you might say, well, why would you need that? Well, you'd be surprised, right? Like, I, I, again, I've taught this class, and you just got to do a lot of examples. This book is perfect, and apparently it works. Like, you do a bunch of examples, and people will learn mathematics. And you can teach calculus, which, you know, is considered by many people to be kind of advanced, to people who just know basic algebra. Oh, this section's really, really cool. It's on non-differentiable functions. It's always a fun uh, explanation to explain uh, why this is not differentiable. And then you can look at it intuitively here. Well, here's here they're, they're, they're doing it algebraically, but you can here, you know, take the limit from the left and the right. So if you take the limit uh, this way, if you approach zero from the left, okay, what's gonna happen is uh, the slope of the secant line, well, it's just gonna be that, right? So that's, that's, it's gonna approach that line. So the slope of that line is negative one. So you're gonna end up getting negative one. And when you approach it from the right, that's just the line y equals x. As you see here, it's defined as a piecewise function. It's just x. So the secant line is just that line, right? And so the secant line approaches the tangent line as h approaches 0. But you see here, it doesn't matter what h is doing because it goes away um, because the secant line is the tangent line in that case. So yeah, here, here it talks about it. Let's read what it says here. We can give a geometric and intuitive reason why the absolute value function is not differentiable at x equals zero. Okay, this is what I was saying. Cool, cool. Let's read it. Its graph consists of two straight lines with slopes plus one and minus one that meet in a corner at the origin. To the right of the origin, the slope is plus one, and to the left of the origin, the slope is negative one. But at the origin, the two conflicting slopes make it impossible to define a single slope. Therefore, the slope, and hence the derivative, is undefined at x equals zero. That's really cool, right? It's really, really powerful, really powerful stuff. And here's other non-differentiable functions. Mm, the corner point. Yeah, corner point. Another good example would be like, here, I'll show you. Um, let me just give you an example. Why not? I have a pen here. Would be something like, I wonder if he has it in here, or they have it in here, the authors. Yeah, I don't, yeah. No, I don't see the one I'm gonna show you. So I'm gonna show you one in particular. This is one I always give people here in class. So we saw this one. We saw the absolute value function. We saw that, you know, that failed to be differentiable because you had that sharp edge. You have that V, right? Another one, though, is x to the 2 thirds. And this one looks like that. It's like a bird. It's like, you know what that's called? That little, that little thing there, that little, it's called a cusp. Okay, it's called a cusp. And so it fails to, to be differentiable uh, at the cusp, okay, at the cusp. Um, you, you could take the derivative, right, for x not equal to 0, f prime of x, well, you can use the power rule, right? You bring down the 2 thirds, and then you subtract 1 from the exponent, so you get negative 1 third, right? Because it'll be 2 thirds minus 1, which is 2 thirds minus 3 thirds. 2 minus 3 is negative 1. And then you bring that number and you, and, you, and you put it down in the front, right? You subtract one. It's the power rule from calculus. But look at this. This function, right? You see this function. Well, the problem with this function is that this function is not defined at zero. So that means that the derivative is undefined. So this bad boy is not defined. 
a derivative doesn't define, doesn't, doesn't exist. So it doesn't, it doesn't exist. So the derivative does not exist at zero because one over zero does not exist. So this is no good. So <clears throat> that's another example of uh, something kind of cool like that. But yeah, yeah, kind of a, a fun topic to, to show people. Oh, another thing I like about this book. Let me just show you something else I like. Um, right here, see these pictures? This is actually, if, you, if you've watched any of my videos, okay, if you've watched any of my YouTube videos where I talk about uh, concavity or increasing or decreasing functions, um, I do stuff like this because of this book, because I think this is better. And also, I, I feel like when I did this in calculus, I think I might have done it that way in class too. I think my teacher taught me that way, but the Stuart and Larson books, they don't, they don't use little arrows like this. And I think that really makes it makes a difference, you know? A lot of times how you show the work, I think makes a really big deal. And it's just whatever works for you, as long as it's mathematically correct, you know, try to do, try to do it the way you enjoy it. Here's a graph, graph rational function. It's gonna have a horizontal asymptote at three. You know that because the, uh, the, the, the exponents are the same, you see two and two. The degree in the numerator is the same as the degree in the denominator. And so when that happens, uh, the horizontal asymptote is going to be the ratio of the leading coefficients. So it'll be y equals three over one, which is three. And here you can see it here. They did it by taking the limit, but that's just a shortcut you can take whenever the degrees match, okay? Then you've got two vertical asymptotes. One is the line x equals two, the other is the line x equals negative two. And look what they do here. The beautiful thing with uh, the little arrows. And you have examples here, more exercises. And you do have answers uh, in the back of the book. They give you answers to all of the odd-numbered exercises. Okay, all of the odd-numbered ones actually have uh, answers. Let's, let's look at some other stuff in this book because I think it's worth taking a look at. Uh, and again, I'll leave a link in the description uh, in case you want to check it out. Oh, this is, I don't want to work through this now, but this is, this is hard or harder. Um, this takes a lot of class time. And this is something that calculus students, students in a regular Calc 1, 2, or 3 class would not see this. By the way, I keep saying regular class. So this would be um, a business calculus class or a concepts of calculus type class, applied calculus, something like that. Calculus for technical students. It would have a different name uh, and it would be offered at your school. So yeah, kind of cool, kind of cool. Let's, get, let's go look at the partial derivatives. I know there's some partial derivative stuff here. It's gonna be near the end here. Oh, look at this, but well, let's look at this first. Or maybe let's just look at this instead. This is interesting. This is something you do in Calc 3 at the beginning, or uh, not at the beginning, but yeah, at the beginning of the multivariable uh, section. When you, first, when you first talk about multivariable stuff, so you do stuff like this find the domain. So like here on number three, just x can't be equal to y, right? So it's a set of all ordered pairs such that that's true. So let's, let, let's, let's see what they do. I'm gonna write down the answer to one of these, like correctly, and then we're gonna look in the back of the book and see how they do. A lot of times books will take shortcuts on these types of things because uh, I don't know why they do that, but. So for example, um, we might need, let's do number one. We should be able to figure this out. We have f of xy equals one over xy. And we have to find the domain of this function. So the domain is the set of inputs. It's a set of ordered pairs. So it's gonna be the set of all ordered pairs, x comma y, such that, and now we need, we need a condition here. So what do we need? Well, x, xy can't be equal to zero, right? So that would be, I guess, an acceptable answer, but this is equal to the set of all ordered pairs, x comma y, such that, x is not zero and y is not zero. These are, these are equal, these are, these are equal sets, right? Let's be careful here, right? Because if x is not zero and y is not zero, that implies that x, y is not zero, right? Because if they're both not zero, then that's not zero. And if, and if this is non-zero, that means that each factor is non-zero. This is true for real numbers, right? Um, it's not true for like matrices. In any case, that would be the domain uh, for this one. Let's do number three. A little bit of multivariable calculus, why not? Um, even though we're not really doing any calculus yet, but multivariable functions. 
So in this case, again, it's a set of all ordered pairs, x comma y, such that, well, x y can't be equal to zero. X minus y can't be equal to zero. Well, what's that? What's that? That's the same thing as saying the set of all ordered pairs such that x is unequal to y. And obviously here, x and y are real numbers. So let's, let's check our answers. Let's check our answers in the back of the book and see if we did this correctly. So this is 7.1, number one and number three. I gotta give it a whiff here. Decent. So 7.1, one and three. Oh, those are those little arrows I was talking about earlier. 7.1, it's gonna be back over here. Okay, so here's what they do. Yeah, yeah, they're good. I mean, not like I'm judging the book, but yeah, no, just uh, they're doing good, they're, good job, right? They use the right, the right set notation. I have seen books uh, or online homework systems that do it incorrectly and like they'll have the answer inputs in a certain way and it kind of like, I, I, I don't know, like for example, they'll do stuff like, I'm gonna complain a little bit, they'll say stuff like, relative maximum. And we'll have a little box like this for your x and your y. Right, so it's fine, they're emphasizing, okay, it is an ordered pair, but it's not, it's not. So let's say the answer is two six, it's not the answer. The maximum is the y value, right? So it, sh it should say relative maximum occurs at, you may say, let's, um, you're, you're splitting hairs. Yeah, but it's math, right? Stuff has to be uh, correct, right? So if something's wrong, um, it, it should be fixed, so. Yeah, but a lot of uh, online homework systems do stuff like that. So, you know, little stuff like that, or there's other little things I've seen in books and online homework. So it's always good to check the answers and make sure they're up to par with correctness and stuff. Or sometimes books are just a little bit sloppy. Uh, I've seen some stuff in engineering books that isn't good. Uh, for example, using, I've seen stuff where they do like DX and they'll put an X up here. Also really, really bad. The hardest thing in this book, by the way, is it's gonna be, I think, 3.4. Yeah, this one. This is probably the hardest section in the entire book. Uh, it's definitely the hardest to teach. It's very, very tricky word problems. These are further applications of optimization. And basically, you're, you're trying to uh, maximize profit and stuff in terms of price reductions. Yeah, it's quite, quite long problems, as you can see. So it takes a bit of work. Here's another uh, section. This is something that I never taught. Uh, elasticity of demand It's just not something I, I taught. But you know, if you took a business calculus course, you, you might learn that. You might learn that in, in your course. Yeah. Yeah, graphing by hand. It's almost a lost art. One of the problems with graphing by hand is that it just takes so long to do it in class, you know? It's so like if you go to college and like you're trying to learn how to do this and like you know you're sitting in class and you, you want an example, it'll take your teacher like I mean it takes a long time if you want to show all the steps. Yeah. Anyways, I just want to show you this book. Uh, I will uh, I'll leave a link in the description in case you want to check it out. If you want to learn math, I have courses. I have calculus courses, differential equations courses, algebra courses. They're all on Udemy, which is a reputable place to have courses. But if you get them please use the links from my website, mathsorcerer.com, or from the description of any of my videos here on YouTube. And subscribe if you want. Check out my Instagram, The Real Math Sorcerer. Check out my X account. I started using it more. I've had it since 2014. Today I decided, hey, I'm gonna start using X more, so. Um, so yeah, check it out there. And I have another channel in Spanish, and I have another channel called The Internet Sorcerer, so I'm all over the internet. But this book, is worth it. And I will leave a link in the description in case you want to check it out. I love it. The worst thing about this book is probably the price, but I think it's worth every penny. As always, keep doing mathematics.